In the last section, we had a very long discussion about the differences between an imperative and a declarative deployment. In this section, we're going to put a little bit of practice into this and get a very practical example of how we might update an existing object using a declarative approach. So what are we going to update? Well, we're going to say that our new goal, the old goal was to just create a container inside of our Kubernetes cluster. We're going to say that our new goal is to update that existing pod that we created to use the multi-worker image as opposed to the current multi-client image that it is currently using. So essentially what we want to do is find that existing pod and update the image that it uses. Now let's take a quick thought on how we would do this with a imperative approach and a declarative approach. So if we took an imperative approach to this, we might do something like the series of steps you see on the left hand side. We might run a command to list out all the different pods that we have inside of our cluster right now. And then maybe we would issue a follow up command to like take an ID or something like that out of the current running pod and tell that thing very explicitly that it should now be running a new image. So in this imperative approach over here, we would have to essentially get the current state of our application by running a command to list out the current pods and find some ID of the current pod that is running the multi-client image. We would then have to figure out a migration strategy on our own to update from the current state to our desired state. Now, in this case, figuring out that migration strategy is pretty straightforward. We could probably look up some command API reference and figure out how we could tell a pod to update the image it uses. But again, that would take a little bit of work. So I'm going to suggest that we instead use a declarative approach. With a declarative approach, updating an existing object inside of our Kubernetes cluster is always going to be the exact same process every single time. So we're going to go and find the config file that originally created that pod, and we'll then make an update to it. The update is going to simply say, hey, I want to use a new image. So inside of the config file that we used to create the pod, we're going to no longer say, I want to use an image of multi-client. Instead, I now want to use a new image of multi-worker. Once we make that change to the config file, we're going to just throw it into kubectl at the command line, and Kubernetes is going to work to update that existing pod to use the new image. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about the process of the declarative approach over here is that we're essentially saying that we're going to take this config file, throw it into kubectl, which is, of course, going to forward it onto master, and somehow, magically, the master is going to realize that it needs to update this existing pod as opposed to creating a new one. And that's actually something that's kind of interesting. We're just going to update this config file. And you might notice that inside this config file, there's really no unique ID or anything like that. There's nothing that says, hey, go and find this existing pod, like a pod we already created and update it. And so it might be a little bit confusing to figure out when making a change to a configuration file will update an existing object, as opposed to just deciding to create a completely new one. So behind the scenes, here's what Kubernetes does anytime that you toss in a configuration file into kubectl and master. So inside of our config file, we're always going to have an object, or we're always going to be creating an object that has a name. So every single last object that you and I ever create with a config file is always going to have a name assigned to it. And in our case, we assigned a name of client-pod. In addition, every single config file we ever put together is going to have an object type assigned to it as well. And technically, it's not like labeled in there as the type. It's really labeled as the kind, recall? Remember, like right here on line two, we say kind pod, not object type. But you get the idea. Every config file is going to list out the type of object that we want to create. So every single time that we take a configuration file and pass it into kubectl, the master is going to look at that configuration file and inspect its name and kind properties. It's then going to look at all the different running services inside the cluster, and it's going to say, OK, if I have any other object inside of here with a identical name, and in this case we do, and an identical type, then that must mean that rather than trying to create a new object, I'm going to try to take the updated configuration file and apply all these changes to the object that already exists inside the cluster. So in other words, the name and the kind are our unique identifying tokens for any object that we create. If you ever want to update an existing object, you're going to take your existing configuration file, you're going to always leave the name the same and the kind the same. 
and you can change the rest of the configuration file and then feed it all into kubectl. And master is going to automatically find the existing object and make updates to it. Now, if we made a change to the name, so if we said client pod, I don't know, new or something like that, well, it now has a new name. So master is going to say, okay, do I have an existing object that is a pod with the name of client pod new? And in this case, we do not. There's no existing object inside of our cluster with that same name and same object type. And so master would say, okay, well, this is a new name. I guess I need to create a brand new object with that name and that type. So in short, anytime that we want to make an update to an existing object, we just go and find the original configuration file. We'll leave the name and the kind the same, and then we can make any other change we want to inside that file. So with that in mind, let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section. We're going to make an update to our configuration file and then feed it into kubectl. And we're going to expect that it's going to update an existing pod as opposed to attempting to create a brand new one. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how we're going to update an existing object. We're going to take that existing config file, leave the name and the kind the same, and we can make any other change we want to to the file and throw that back into kubectl. And our expectation is that we're going to update an existing object as opposed to creating a new one. So let's flip on over to our config file. Remember our goal right now is to update the existing pod to use the multi-worker image instead of the multi-client. Now, quick note here, remember that the multi-worker image really expects to have a copy of Redis available. And so it's entirely possible that when we do this update, something is going to crash, or I should say the container that gets created might crash because there is no copy of Redis available. Nonetheless, I just want to make sure that we have the ability to update the image that is being used. And I'm not really concerned about getting a pod successfully running. I just want to update the image right now. That's all. All right, so we're going to open up our code editor. We're going to find the client pod file. We're going to leave the kind the same and the name identical as well. The only thing we're going to update inside of here is the image that we are using. So instead of using multi-client, I'm going to use multi-worker instead. We'll leave everything else inside of here identical. I'm not gonna change the port, even though multi-worker doesn't really expose anything on port 3000 or anything like that. Again, I just wanna update the image and make sure that we are updating a pod in place and not creating a new separate pod. All right, so I made the change to multi-worker. I'm going to save the file. I'm going to flip back over to my terminal. I'm going to make sure I'm still inside my simple k aids directory. And then I'm going to feed this updated configuration file back into kubectl by using that apply command. Remember, apply is the magic command. It's how we make any changes to, our con to the configuration of our Kubernetes cluster. So I'll say kubectl apply dash f client dash pod dot yaml. And now you'll notice that when we hit enter and we submit that command, we do not see something that says like, oh, I'm going to update or I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to create a new pod or anything like that. Instead, it says very specifically, client pod has been configured. When you see the message configured, it means that we've updated the configuration that is applied to client dash pod. So we should now be able to run that get pods command and verify that there is still one pod that exists inside of our entire cluster. So I'll do kubectl get pods. And you'll notice that we now have still just one pod. It has a name of client pod. There's one copy, it's running. There's two restarts currently because we just caused this thing to be restarted when we updated the image that it's running. Now, the only thing that's kind of awkward right now is that we can't really inspect this pod and verify that it is in fact running the updated image. So I want to figure out some way that we can actually look at this very specific pod right here and look at the different containers that are running inside there and verify that 100% no two ways about it, yes, we are running the multi-worker image. So in order to inspect this very particular pod right here, we're going to learn a new command on kubectl. Here's the new command. Oh, not there, not there. Where'd it go? Here we go. So to get detailed information about an object inside of our cluster, we're going to use the kubectl describe command. Describe is used to print out a ton of information about a very particular object. So we'll say kubectl describe. We'll then pass in an object type 
and then the name of the particular object that we want to investigate. Now, just as a quick curiosity here or something that's kind of interesting, you can actually omit the object name if you want to. If you do that, you'll get detailed information about every different object type of the specified, or excuse me, every different object with the specified object type. But it's a ton of information, so in general, we usually use the full command, which is kubectl describe the type and the name to just get information about that one particular object. So let's try that out right now. Again, we're going to run this command to verify that the client pod is in fact running that updated image. So I'll do kubectl describe. Our object type is pod, so we could simply say pod. Either one is fine, pods or pod. And then we'll put in the name of that very particular object which is client-pod. So that's going to print out a ton of very detailed information about that very particular pod. Down at the very bottom, you're going to see a series of events right here. Very frequently, this is going to be some of the most interesting information. This is going to be events that are not logs coming out of the containers, but events that have occurred over the life cycle of the pod. So you'll see messages about things that have crashed or pulling new images or changing images or stuff like that. Now, if we scroll up a little bit higher, there is a ton of information in here that's kind of outside the scope of what we want to talk about right now. But if you scroll up, scroll up, scroll up, you will see containers. We have a container with a name of client. Recall that client name right there was provided inside of our configuration file. So there's name client right there. And then we're told that the client container, remember that's the name of the container, this is kind of misleading because we have this, these kind of conflicting names all over the place, but essentially the image is the multi-worker image. That's exactly what we just updated our configuration file to use. So without a doubt, updating that configuration file and leaving the name and the kind identical found an existing object that was already running inside of our cluster and it updated it in place as opposed to trying to create a completely separate pod. All right, so that's it. That's a quick example of this entire idea of declarative versus imperative deployments. So we like to use declarative as much as possible. And the formula, formula for doing a declarative update is always going to be the same thing over and over. We're going to go find our original config file. We're going to make a change to it, leaving the type or kind and the name the same. We'll update some configuration inside the file, and then we're going to throw it back into kubectl. And our master is just going to kind of make the change for us. And we don't have to worry about manually printing out a list of running pods and issuing a command to update a very specific pod or anything like that. We're going to see this declarative approach throughout this entire course just nonstop. It's going to be all we are doing throughout the entire course. Update the config file, throw it in kubectl, verify that in fact everything worked correctly. Okay, so that's a good example. Let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we made a change to our pod configuration file. The very particular property that we updated was the image right here. We then fed that back into kubectl and we saw the updated pod using the describe command. In this section, I want to make another change to this configuration file. Now this next change we're going to make is going to appear to be a very small change, like similar in nature to changing the image, but when we try to feed the configuration file or the updated configuration file in the kubectl, we're going to very quickly see an error message. So let's go through this process. We're going to see the error message and we'll talk about why we are seeing the error message that we're going to see. All right, so inside my client pod file, I'm going to find the container port listed down here. Now remember, multi-worker doesn't do anything with container port 3000. No usage whatsoever. Multi-worker has no ability to receive or make outgoing requests or anything like that. So we'll just make an arbitrary change here. I'm going to change the container port from 3000 to about 9999, like so. Okay, so totally arbitrary change, no rhyme or reason behind it. I'm going to save this file now. And then we're going to try to update our pod in place by using the kubectl apply command again. And again, when we run this command, you're going to see an error message. And we're going to talk about why we are seeing the error message. All right, so I'm going to save the file. I'll then flip back over to my terminal. And I'll do kubectl apply client odd.yaml again. And when I run this command, we're going to see this tremendous amount of output right here. I want you to scroll up to the very top of this message. And up here, you're going to see the reason for the error. 
Essentially, it says that we are not allowed to update any pod configuration piece other than the image used, some other image property, some active deadline something, or tolerations property. So this error message right here is essentially saying that when we update a pod, we are only allowed to update these four different configuration properties. And so this definitely kind of goes very much in the face of what I just told you about how we make updates. I had just told you two seconds ago that, yeah, we make updates to existing objects by updating the configuration file and then feeding that into kubectl. But in this case, we just made a very simple change to our configuration file and we very quickly saw an error message. So how do we use this kind of configuration file based process of updating something if kubectl won't allow us to change something as basic as a container port? Well, of course, there is a workaround to this. So let's take a quick pause right here and we're going to come back to the next section and we're going to start to investigate how we can use a different type of object besides a pod to be allowed to change any piece of configuration tied to a pod that we want to. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we made a very small change to our pod configuration file, updating its container port. But when we did so, we very quickly saw an error message that said that we were not allowed to update certain fields that are tied to a pod. So essentially that message is telling us that there are some fields that we are allowed to update, such as the image that a pod uses, but there are other fields we are not allowed to touch at all once the pod has been created. And so this kind of flies in the face of everything I just told you about making changes to a configuration file. In other words, how are we going to change a configuration file to change an object inside of our cluster if there are fields that we are not at all allowed to update or touch? Well, to solve this issue, we're going to start making use of a new type of object that is going to replace our usage of pod inside of our very simple application as it stands right now. So the new type of object that we're going to make use of, in addition to pods and services, is something called a deployment. A deployment is a Kubernetes object that is meant to maintain a set of identical pods. So that can be one pod, two pod, three pod, whatever number. And the deployment is going to constantly work to make sure that every single pod in its set that it's supposed to manage is always running the con correct configuration and is always in a runnable state. In other words, it is not crashing or it's not dead or anything like that. Now, a deployment is very similar in nature to a pod. Yes, I just said a deployment contains a set or maintains a set of pods, but at the end of the day, we can use either deployments or pods with Kubernetes to run containers for our application. So let's compare and contrast some of the differences between pods and deployments. So with the pod, we're running a single set of very closely related containers. Remember in a pod, we're only gonna stick in multiple containers if they have very tight integration with each other. In reality, pods are only used in a development environment. And usually only if you have like a very one-off single container or a very small group of containers that you want to run. We do not actually make use of pods directly in a production environment because of all these limitations around being able to update its configuration and stuff like that. Now a deployment on the other hand, again, is meant to set or excuse me, is meant to run and manage a set of identical pods. So that is one or more, that can be one pod, two pod, three pod, however many you want. In that set of pods, every pod is going to be running the exact same set of containers with identical configuration. Now the deployment itself is going to monitor the state of each pod. It's going to watch the configuration of each one. It's going to make sure that every pod is running the container successfully inside of it. If any pod happens to crash for any reason, the deployment is going to automatically attempt to restart that pod or completely recreate it in a fresh new state. We make use of deployments in a development environment and we use them as the primary means of running containers in a production environment as well. So in this course, I first started off showing you pods just so you understand here is a very basic way of creating a container with Kubernetes. But in reality, when we start making use of Kubernetes for any series purpose, we make use of deployments as opposed to individual pods. So from here on forward, we're going to kind of tend to forget that pods exist and we're going to instead make use of deployments for running all of our different containers. Again, behind the scenes, a deployment is just making use of pods, so it's still very important to understand what a pod is and how you work with one. But again, we're going to make use of deployments in our development and production environments.
Now, the last thing I want to show you is just a very quick diagram here of what's kind of going on behind the scenes. So when we create a deployment object, it's going to have attached to it something called a pod template. A pod template is essentially a little block of configuration file, or excuse me, a little block of configuration that says, hey, here's what any pod that is created by this deployment is supposed to look like. So the pod template might say, okay, every pod that this deployment manages is supposed to have one container that has a name of client that exposes port 3000 and uses the image multi-worker. And so that deployment would use this template to create a pod that looks like this. A pod that has a name of, oh, not client pod, just simply client. It's running the multi-worker image and it exposes port 3000 to the outside world. If we made a ch change to the pod template over here, like let's say we're instead supposed to expose port 3000, we change that to 999 like so, then the deployment would attempt to either change the existing pod that it's managing, or alternatively, it would attempt to kill this pod entirely and replace it with a brand new pod that has the correct port assigned to it, like so. So again, this deployment object over here is going to be constantly watching all of the different pods that it maintains. It's going to be watching their state and making sure that they have the correct state. So at the end of the day, to solve this issue that we're having right now with updating the configuration for our pod, rather than trying to make use of a pod and update the container port, we're going to instead refactor this thing to instead be a deployment that creates a pod running the multi-worker image and with a very specific container port. Once we make use of the deployment, all those restrictions around updating certain variables, like say the container port right here or the name of the container, will be lifted. With a deployment, we can change any piece of configuration tied to a pod that we want to. We don't have to worry about seeing that error message like we did previously. Okay, so let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back in the next section. We're going to start to refactor our client pod file or just completely recreate it for that matter. And we're going to turn it into a deployment object type instead. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started talking about deployment objects. Remember, a deployment is going to run and manage a set of identical pods. From this point forward throughout this course, we are no longer going to create pods ourselves manually. Instead, we're going to create deployments that will create pods for us. So deployments are appropriate for use in both a development and production environment. We're going to make a deployment that has a pod template that's going to try to create a container using the image multi-client and we're going to make sure that port 3000 is exposed. Now, the reason we're going to make a deployment with multi-client and port 3000 open is so that we can test this out in the browser once the deployment creates our actual pod. So to make a deployment, we're going to use the same process that we use for every other object that we're ever going to create with Kubernetes. We're going to make a configuration file and then feed that configuration file into kubectl. So inside of my code editor, I'm going to create a new configuration file inside of my root project directory. And I'll give this file a name of client-deployment.yaml. And then inside this file, we're going to add all of our configuration to describe this new deployment that we're making. We're going to write out all the configuration together right now, and then we'll talk about the purpose of every line immediately after that. So I'll get started by writing out API version and I'll say apps slash v1. I'll specify kind of deployment. So these two lines right here, I bet you can guess what's going on. We are saying that we want to use a object that is defined inside the API version of app slash v1. And the specific type of object that we want to create is a deployment. Next up, we'll put down our metadata section and we'll give this thing a name of client dash deployment. Then we'll do our spec after that. For the spec, we'll say replicas is one. I'll add on a selector with match labels and a component web property like so. I'll then unindent, so I now only have one indent right here. I'll say template. I'll put in metadata, labels, component web, I'm going to unindent again so that I'm on the same indentation layer as metadata. I'll say spec, containers, and we'll define the list of containers that we want created with every pod that is controlled by this deployment. 
So this is a array entry, so I'll put in my little dash like so. And I'll say that I want a pod that has a name, or be a container in this pod with a name of client. I want it to run the image of my Docker ID slash multi client. And then finally, we'll set up that port mapping. So I'll say ports with a container port of 3000, like so. Okay, so some things inside this file might look a little bit familiar. Let's take a quick pause. We're gonna come back to the next section and start breaking this thing down line by line. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our first configuration file to create a deployment. In this section, we're going to walk through the configuration file and talk about a couple of interesting things that's inside of here. Now again, the first two lines that you see specify the API version and the object type that we want to create. So in this case, we're making an object of type deployment. After that, we see a very familiar metadata section that names the object that's going to be created by this configuration file. So in our case, our deployment will have a name of client-deployment. Now down in the spec section, I wanna skip on down to the template property right here. So inside the template, we're listing out the configuration that is going to be used for every single pod that is created by this deployment. The entire template section right here probably looks a little bit familiar to some of the configuration that we put together inside of our client pod.yaml file. So back inside of client pod, we had a label, we had a list of containers assigned as well. And so you can essentially imagine that this template section right here is defining the exact configuration that should be used for every pod that is created and maintained by this deployment. Every pod that gets created by this deployment will have a label of component web and it will have a container with the name of client and using the image multi-client with a port 3000 mapped up to that container. Now, besides the template right here, the other properties that are kind of interesting is replicas and selector. So first off, replicas. As you might guess, this is specifying the number of different pods that this deployment is supposed to make. And remember, every one of those pods that it creates are going to be absolutely identical in nature. So at this point, we are saying, hey, deployment, create exactly one pod using this template down here. If we wanted to, we could very easily change this up to something like five. And that means that we would want to create five separate pods, each of which run this exactly identical template. We're going to leave replicas as one for right now, however. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting inside of here is the selector. The selector looks very similar to a selector property that we previously put into our node port file. So back over here, we had a selector property as well. Let's talk about what the selector is. Essentially, it's doing something very similar to what the selector inside of the service configuration file was doing. You see, when a deployment creates a pod, it doesn't directly create the pod itself and maintain it. Instead, the deployment reaches out to the Kubernetes API on the master and it says, hey, master, I need you to create a pod for me and here's the configuration for it. The master then goes ahead and creates the pod. Now it's the master or some program inside the master that is creating the pod for us. And so the deployment after the pod is created needs to somehow get a handle on the pod that is created. And that's the purpose of that selector field. The deployment says, okay, I'm gonna ask master or some program in master to create this pod for me. After it gets created, I need to somehow get a handle on it. And so to get a handle on that newly created pod, I'm gonna look for objects with a label of component web. And so of course, every pod that we are creating using this deployment is going to have a label of component web because that's what we specified inside of our template. And so match labels and selector right here, this section right here is essentially giving us a handle on this label down here. I know it seems a little bit repetitive to have to kind of like designate this stuff twice inside the same file, but it's entirely possible that we might have multiple labels assigned to our deployment, or excuse me, multiple labels assigned to the pod that is created by our deployment. And maybe we only want our deployment to look for one or two very specific labels out of those. So that's why you're seeing it kind of replicated here twice. Okay, so that's pretty much it for our deployment configuration file. So let's take a quick pause right here. We'll come back to the next section and we're going to apply this deployment file to our Kubernetes cluster by using kubectl. And then we'll very quickly be able to look at a couple of interesting things around the deployment and the pod that is created with it. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. 
In the last section, we finished up our client deployment configuration file, and we're now ready to toss this thing off to kubectl and see it running on our local cluster. Now, before we do, I want to give you a very quick reminder. If you flip over to your terminal and do a kubectl git pods, you'll recall that we still have the original pod that we had created with our client pod.yaml configuration file. I think that would be really nice if we got rid of this pod or somehow deleted it before we sent out our deployment. That way that when we get our pods in the future, we will only see the one pod that was created by the deployment as opposed to the one pod from the deployment and this one pod from the original client pod configuration file we had created. So I want to figure out how we can delete this existing pod. Now to remove an existing object, we're going to be making use of the configuration file that was used to create it. So in order to remove an existing object, we're going to run kubectl delete dash f and it will pass in the config file that was used to create that object. When we pass in that configuration file, kubectl is going to look at the file. So here's the client pod file. It's going to look at this file. It's going to look at the kind property right here and the name specified as well. kubectl is then going to try to find an object with the same type that has the same name. And when it, f when it finds it, it's going to delete it. Now, one thing I want to mention very quickly here is that this delete command seems an awful lot like an imperative update to our cluster. And in fact, it really is. This is an imperative update. We are issuing a very direct command that says, hey, Kubernetes, I want you to make this very discreet change to the state of our cluster. Now, unfortunately, this is something that we really just can't quite get over. When we want to delete, create a resource or change an existing resource, we pass in an updated configuration file. And so we're kind of leaving it up to Kubernetes to make the appropriate changes. But when we want to delete our resource, unfortunately, if we wanted to delete some object inside of our cluster, we would have to kind of take the entire state of our entire cluster and then like subtract out that one object. In other words, it's just kind of hard to picture a way to make a declarative update that will delete an existing object. And so this is going to be the one kind of location where we kind of fall back to the idea of an imperative update to the state of our cluster. Okay, let's give this a shot. So back at my command line, I'll do kubectl delete dash f, and then I'll specify the client dash pod dot yaml file. And then we'll see that the pod with the name of client pod was deleted. Now, if it appears that this command just seems to hang, it will eventually resolve after about 10 seconds or so. When the pod gets deleted, it's going through the same process in the background that usually gets applied to deleting a container with the Docker CLI. Remember, when you delete a container or stop a container, I should say, the container is given 10 seconds to resolve and then eventually it just gets killed. That's what happens in the Docker world. And the same thing is what happens when we delete a running pod. It gets 10 seconds to resolve and eventually turn itself off. And then after those 10 seconds, the thing automatically just gets axed entirely. If we now do a kubectl get pods, we'll see that we no longer have any running pods. Okay, so now that we've cleaned things up a little bit, let's try applying our configuration file of client deployment.yaml to our cluster. After we apply this thing, we should see a new single running pod using the multi-client image. So I'm going to flip over to my terminal and I'll do a kubectl apply dash f client dash deployment dot yaml. And then we very quickly see that the deployment was created. So we can now print out the status of all of our pods with kubectl get pods. And we'll see that there is exactly one pod running right now. And it has a randomly generated name, very clearly tied to the client deployment that we just created. We can also print out the status of that deployment itself using the command kubectl git deployments. So we're still using the git command, the same one we were using before, but we're changing the type of object that we are looking for. So now as opposed to looking for pods, we're looking for deployments. So I'll run that and we'll see that we have one deployment called client deployment. You'll also notice a couple of interesting columns on here. We have ones across the board for desired, current, up-to-date, and available. Desired is a reference to the number of replicas or the number of pods that this deployment wants to eventually have. So at present, inside of our configuration file, we said that we want exactly one replica running. 
And so we have desired of one. We then see current, so that's the number of pods that are up and running. We have up to date, which is also one. So at any point in time that you make a configuration change to your deployment, specifically a configuration change to the template down here, the deployment would automatically mark all the existing pods as being out, out of date. And so we might see up to date go down to zero. And then as the existing pods get updated or recreated with that new configuration state, they'll eventually restore this up to date field. And then finally available right here is the number of pods controlled by this deployment that are ready and available to accept incoming client traffic or essentially just successfully running their containers with the appropriate configuration for each one. Okay, so that's it. So we've now seen how we can use a deployment to create a set of pods, or in this case, just one single pod. Now, the last thing I wanna do is still make sure that we are able to visit our running application inside of the browser. So we want to make sure that this pod right here is in fact successfully running the multi-client image. And I wanna make sure that we can still access our React project files. So let's take a quick pause right here. We'll come back to the next section and we'll make sure that we can still access this pod or this container in our browser in the next section. In the last section, we finally applied our first deployment to our local cluster. Now, just to make sure that everything is working the way we expect, I want to try to connect to the container inside of that pod running the multi-client image. And when we connect to it, we should see that little React application appear on the screen. So I want you very quickly to remember how we connect to our local cluster. We do not use localhost. We have to run that minikube IP command. Remember that minikube virtual machine that is our local node has its own IP, completely different from localhost. So we need to first run minikube IP. Once we get the IP address, we'll then make sure that we connect to the port that was associated with that service that we created which was hard-coded to be 31515. So back at my terminal, I'll do minikube IP. There's the IP of my virtual machine. I'll copy it. I'll make a new tab inside my browser, and then I'll put on colon 31515, because again, that is the hard-coded port of our service. And then when I do so, I do in fact successfully see my application appear on the screen. Awesome. Now, this is actually going to be a really good time to start to understand why we use these service things. Like, why do we have to create that service object? Why were we not able before to just directly connect to one of our pods that was running the container that we care about? Well, now that we understand the idea behind deployments, understanding why we have to have these service things is going to make a lot more sense. So one thing I wanna show you very quickly, back over at your terminal, try running the, the command kubectl get pods, and then we're gonna add on an argument here of dash O wide, like so. That's going to still get our list of pods, but it's going to append on a little bit of additional information. Now I'm gonna zoom out here really quickly just so I can see this thing on a single line. There we go. Now I want you to notice how we now have these IP and node columns over on the right-hand side. Now the really important column to take notice of here is the IP column. Every single pod that we create gets its own IP address assigned to it. So when we just deployed our deployment just two seconds ago, and that created a pod, it was randomly assigned an IP address of 172.1706. This is an IP address that is internal to our virtual machine. So you and I cannot visit that IP, or at least we cannot visit it very easily. It is an IP address that has been assigned to the pod inside of our node right here. Now, the interesting thing about that is that if this pod ever gets deleted or if an additional one is created, or if for any reason the pod gets updated or changed in any way, shape or form whatsoever, it's entirely possible that the pod might suddenly get a brand new IP address. So let's imagine that this pod right here has that IP address of something like, I don't know, the 172.001. We'll just kind of make up an IP address like so. So I want you to imagine if we figured out some way to connect our browser to a pod running directly inside of our node. Then inside of our browser, we would type in something like 172001. And then we would probably want to connect to port 3000. So we'd probably put on colon 3000 or something like that. Now the problem starts to arise 
if we start to recreate this pod right here, because maybe we have to remake it because our configuration has changed on the deployment, or maybe the original pod crashed, or whatever reason it might be. And so we can imagine that maybe we have to create a second pod. And this one would get a randomly generated IP of something like 002. And then maybe this original pod gets deleted. Well, now we originally had that IP address of 172.0.0.1. That IP address is not going to work anymore because the object or the pod associated with it just plain no longer exists. And so in order to access this pod right here, we would, in theory, now have to manually type in that 002, like so. Now, as you might guess, having to update the IP address all the time inside your browser in a development environment would definitely be a big pain. And that's why we make use of these service objects. The service is going to watch for every pod that matches its selector. Because remember, that service has a selector. If we look at client nodeport.yaml, it has the selector of component web. So the service is going to look for every pod with that selector and then automatically route traffic directly over to it. So that's why we make use of the service. These pods are coming and going all the time. They're getting deleted, they're getting recreated, and every time they potentially might get assigned a brand new IP address. The service is going to kind of abstract out that difficulty, and that's why we make use of these services anytime that we want to connect to one of our different pods. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a better idea of why we care about these service things. So let's take a quick pause right here, and we'll continue in the next section. In this section, we're going to start making some changes to our deployment configuration file and just verify that all the pods that are associated with this deployment successfully get updated. So in particular, I really want to try updating the container port value down here from 3000 to some other value. Because you will recall that when we tried changing that container port inside of our client.pod, or excuse me, client-pod.yaml file, we very quickly got an error message saying, hey, you can't update that value. Okay, so back inside of the client deployment, so we're in the deployment file right now, I'm gonna find the container port and I'll update the port to 99999 like so. Now, just so you know, when we change this port assignment, you will no longer be able to visit our application inside of the browser. So in case you apply this update and then try to test it out inside the browser, it's not going to work because the container doesn't care about port 999. It wants to expose traffic on port 3000. Okay, so now that we changed our configuration file, I'm gonna make sure that I save the file and then I'm going to go back over to my terminal and we're gonna do the same thing we always do anytime we want to update an object. We'll do a kubectl apply dash f client deployment.yaml. So I'll run that and then it tells us very directly that an existing object type with this name was configured. It says configured as opposed to something being created. So we definitely just made a change to an existing deployment as opposed to creating a new one entirely. We can now do a kubectl get deployments to print out all of our deployments. Yep, it's still there. I can do a kubectl get pods. And now with this, you're gonna see something a little bit more interesting. Notice how the age of this pod right here is 26 seconds. So clearly when we apply this configuration file right here, Kubernetes noticed that we made a change to the template for the pods that are being controlled by this deployment. It saw that we changed the container port. And so rather than trying to update the existing pod that already existed, it deleted that pod and completely recreated it with the new container port value right here. Okay, now one thing that would be really nice to do is make sure that this new pod right here is in fact running with that new port. So I'll do a kubectl describe pods. We'll get the long form description about this pod right here, and we'll probably be able to verify that port 999 is assigned to it. Now remember, when you do describe pods, the name of whatever you want to look up is completely optional. In this case, we only have one pod, so I'll just print out the information about all pods because, hey, there's only one. Okay, so when I run that, I'll scroll up a little bit, and then I should be able to see our list of containers. Here's the client container and it has port 999 mapped on it. So without a doubt, this pod is running with the most up-to-date configuration. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now I wanna do one other change or one or two other changes here. Let's first try scaling up our replicas setting right here. 
So when we scale up from one to something like say five, we're now going to have our deployment attempt to create five different pods, all with this identical template right here. So I'm going to make sure I update replicas to five. I'll save the file. And then as usual, we'll do a kubectl apply client deployment.yaml. And now if you type in very quickly kubectl get deployments, we might, okay, a little bit too slow that case. In that case, you'll notice that everything says five right here. If we were a little bit faster, we might be able to see that there are less than five of these different pods available. We'll make another change in a second that we'll hopefully be able to, if we type in this get deployments fast enough, we might be able to see the update in action. And we'll see something like, hey, only five or maybe one or even zero pods are currently available. So if we now do a kubectl get pods, you'll notice we have five separate pods, each of which are running a unique copy of that very specific client, let's see, multi-client, that's the idea, or that's the name of it, multi-client image. So we now have five containers running, each in their own very separate little pod. Let's try making one more configuration change. So how about instead of running the image multi-client, let's try running the image multi-worker instead. So I'm gonna change the name of the image that we're running inside this pod. I'm gonna make sure I save the file. And now this time, after we do the kubectl apply dash f client deployment, I'm gonna very quickly, right after I run this command, I'm gonna very quickly do a kubectl get deployments. And hopefully we'll be able to see some different numbers of containers, or excuse me, different numbers of pods inside there as the deployment is creating and destroying some of the pods inside of our cluster. Okay, so I'm gonna hit enter here. And then very quickly, I'll do a kubectl get deployments. Uh, now that's interesting. So notice I typed in fast enough that I was able to see some different numbers in action here. So the client deployment wants to have five different pods with the very specific configuration listed right here. But at present, there are seven pods. That means that maybe five of the old version exist, or actually, you know, we can use these other numbers here to figure it out. So there are seven pods total, and four of them are up-to-date and available. That means that we have four up-to-date and available pods running the newest configuration that says that we should be running the multi-worker image. That means that there are three other pods, because seven minus four is three, means that there are three pods still sitting around using the old configuration, and those need to be deleted and cleaned up. If we now do kubectl get deployments again, we're probably gonna see five across the board because now all the old versions of those pods have been deleted and replaced with the latest up-to-date version of the pod spec, which says that we need to have the multi-worker image running inside there. Okay, so it's pretty interesting to see these deployments in action. So let's take another quick pause. We're gonna come back to the next section, and I wanna point out one or two kind of interesting things about this entire deployment system that might trip you up when you start making use of it in a production environment. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last couple of sections, we've looked at a couple of different ways of updating a deployment. So we understand that we can change the number of replicas and we can change, say, the container port or even the image that is used by this deployment whenever it is creating a pod. But one thing that we haven't quite looked at is how we can update a deployment when a new version of an image becomes available. So I want you to imagine for a second that maybe you and I go off to our multi-worker project and maybe we make an update to that image and then we push the image up to Docker Hub. How would we somehow get our deployment to pull down that latest version and recreate all of our pods using that latest version? I wanna look into that a little bit inside this section. Now let's take a look at a diagram that's going to explain the series of changes we're going to make to our project to kind of simulate updating an image and kind of simulate how we would update a deployment to accommodate for that updated image. Okay, so first off, we're going to update our deployment and we're going to change it to use the multi-client image again. The only reason that we're going to change it to use multi-client is that it gives us something to look at inside the browser. And so it makes it really easy to verify that our pods are running the correct version of an image. After that, we're then going to go back over to the source code for our multi-client project. We're going to make a change to that project. We're going to rebuild the image and then push the image up to Docker Hub. So that's gonna simulate a very real deployment or a very real change to an application. 
all the time when you're using Kubernetes and all this container stuff, you're going to want to change an image and you're going to want to make sure that the latest version of that image eventually gets deployed onto your Kubernetes cluster. After we push that changed image up to Docker Hub, we're then going to somehow get our deployment to recreate all of its pods with that latest version of multi-client that you and I create. So let's get to it. Step number one is going to be to change our deployment to use multi-client again. So inside of my code editor, I'm going to find the client deployment.eml file. We're going to make a couple changes in here. The first thing I'm going to do is reduce the number of replicas down to one. So we're just going to run one replica all by itself. That's just going to make it a little bit easier for testing purposes so that we can get a better idea of when that single pod is being updated or recreated or whatever it might be. Next up, we're going to change our image right here. So instead of multi-worker, we're going to get multi-client. And then one other thing that I want to do on the image right here, besides putting on multi-client, is I want to make sure that we also update the port that is exposed or forwarded on that image. So a container port rather than 999, we're going to change that back to 3000 like so. Because you remember that is the port that is exposed or that Nginx inside the multi-client image is going to listen on. Okay, so that looks good. Let's now take these changes. I'm going to save this file, and then I'm going to apply this new configuration to our Kubernetes cluster. So back at my terminal, I'll do a kubectl apply client deployment.yaml. So I'm going to make that change, and then we will want to very quickly test this out inside the browser and make sure that we can access that newly created container that's inside of that new pod. So remember, anytime they want to access our app inside the browser, we need to get our minikube IP with the minikube IP command. I'll copy the IP address, then we'll go back over to our browser. I'll paste in that IP, and remember, we set up that service to listen on port 31515. So I'll do colon 31515. And then I see our application appear. Okay, so that's easy enough. Let's take a pause right now. When we come back to the next section, we're going to make an update to the multi-client image, and then we're going to push it up to Docker Hub. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started to investigate how we can get a deployment to make sure that all of our pods are using the latest version of an image that is available. So in the last section, we flipped our deployment to use the multi-client again. We're now going to go back to the complex project, that's the multi-container project that we worked on previously, and we're going to update the multi-client image. So inside of my terminal, I'm going to open up a second tab, and then I'll navigate over to the complex project that we had previously put together. Remember that inside of here we have that client folder, that's where the multi-client project is coming from. So I'm going to change into that directory, and then I'm going to start up my code editor inside of that client folder. All right, so here we go. So I've got my client project right here. Inside of the client project is that SRC folder, and inside there are a couple of different React components. And so to update our multi-client image and get kind of a change this thing that we can very easily see inside of our browser when we run this application, I'm going to open up the app.js file. And inside of here, I'm going to find the render method. Inside there, we have an h1 right here. I think that a very easy to detect change that we can make would be to alter the title that appears on the page. So rather than simply saying fib calculator, I'm going to put on fib calculator version two, like so. So that's just going to be a very simple change that will appear inside of our browser and it'll make it very obvious when we are using a newer version of this particular image. All right, so I'm going to save this file and then we're going to close that code editor and we'll then rebuild our image and push it back up to Docker Hub. So back at my command line, I'm going to make sure that I'm still inside of that client directory. We'll do a Docker build, and we'll be sure to tag this thing with your Docker ID slash multi-client, like so. And then I'll specify my build context with a dot at the very end. Don't forget the dot. Okay, so I'm going to run that. It's going to rebuild the entire image. Now, remember, we have to rerun the build portion of that script because we made a change to our source code. After all that, we finally get our new image created. So now the last thing we have to do is push this new image up to Docker Hub. So I'll do a docker push my docker ID slash multi-client like so. Okay, so it's going to push that set of changes up 
And there we go, that's pretty much it. So now Docker Hub has the latest version of our multi-client image. And now it's just up to us to figure out how we can somehow get our deployment to make use of that newer image for all the pods that it manages. So let's take a quick pause right here. We'll come back to the next section and we're gonna figure out how we can somehow get our deployment to update all of the pods that it manages. In the last section, we updated our multi-client image and then we pushed the result off to Docker Hub. We're now going to move on to step three, which is to somehow convince our deployment to recreate or otherwise update all of our pods with the latest version of that multi-client image. Now, unfortunately, step three right here is very challenging and there's not a very good solution around it. Now that might be very surprising, but I just wanna be very clear with you in the world of Kubernetes, convincing a deployment to recreate our pods with the latest version of an image is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So inside this section, we're going to take a look at why this is challenging, and then we're going to look at a couple of different ways to solve this problem. Now, before we start talking about why this is challenging or any of the solutions, I wanna very quickly mention to you that on the GitHub page for the Kubernetes repo, you can go to the issues board and reference issue number 33664. To get to this issue in particular, you can just type that issue number directly into your address bar. This is a entire issue with a ton of different conversation going on here, talking about how challenging it is and suggesting different ways of convincing your deployment file to somehow update all the pods that it is managing. So I do recommend maybe taking a quick glance at this issue thread and getting a better idea of some of the root causes here and some of the different ways of solving the problem. All right, so let's take a look first at why this is so challenging to get a deployment to update the image that is being used by all the pods that it manages. I wanna first remind you that in order to update any object inside of our Kubernetes cluster, we make a change to our deployment file and then we send the deployment file off to the kubectl command line tool with something that looks like this right here, right? We do the kubectl apply. Now the issue that we have right now is that inside of our deployment file, there's nothing inside of here that says, hey, I want to use some particular version of our multi-client image. So when we send an update to multi-client off to Docker Hub, when we make our updated version of that image and we send it off, there's nothing that we can kind of turn back around to this file with and say, hey, I want you to now use like the latest image. Now, the reason that's such a big deal is that if we try to take an unchanged configuration file and apply it with kubectl, if there's no changes in the configuration file, then kubectl apply is just going to flat out reject the file. Let's try that out right now. Remember, we've already applied this file and we've made no changes to it since we last authored it. Okay, or excuse me, since we last applied it. So back at my command line, I'll do a kubectl apply dash f, client deployment.yaml. And then when I run this command, it's gonna tell us that the file is unchanged. And so the entire file, the entire apply command is just flat out rejected because the config that we're trying to upload is identical to the last config we put in place. Now, when you put this file up, it's unchanged. That means totally rejected. So there's nothing inside that process that says, oh, we should probably go and see if a new version of this image is available. That does not occur. At no point when you try to re-upload or reapply that config file, it does not try to see if a new version of this image is available. And so the entire apply command just flat out rejected. That's why this is such a big issue. Okay, so with all that in mind, we're now gonna look at a diagram that's gonna lay out three possible solutions that we could use to get around this issue. So none of these solutions are really that great, I'll be honest with you. None of them are really that good. They're kind of the best of a bad situation. Okay, so here's the first option we can use to get our deployment to update with the latest version of that image. We could manually delete all the pods that are managed by that deployment. Now, when we manually delete a pod that is managed by a deployment, the deployment is going to very quickly notice that the, deploy that the pod is missing and it's going to attempt to recreate it automatically. So in other words, if we go over to our terminal right now and do a kubectl get pods and then attempt to delete this pod right here, the deployment will very quickly notice that it has a missing pod and the deployment will recreate this thing automatically. So our hope there would be that when the pod gets recreated, hopefully it would pull down the latest version of that image. And so we could use that as a means to recreate our pods with the latest image or excuse me, latest version of some particular image.
Now, why would we not do this? Well, as you might guess, deleting pods seems like a really, really silly situation or a really silly solution. There's so many things that could go wrong with this approach. In a production environment, we could very easily accidentally delete the wrong set of pods. Totally possible. So if we delete the wrong set of pods, who knows what type of bad situation we would be in. In addition, if we manually delete all of our pods related to one very particular aspect of our application, let's imagine that maybe this is the pod that serves up all of our web traffic. And so if we delete all those pods for a very brief period of time, any user trying to access our application would be trying to get at a pod or get at a container inside of there that just doesn't exist. And for a very brief window, our users would essentially not be able to access our application entirely. And so everything about deleting these pods just kind of seems like a bad idea. Okay, so let's take a look at the second possible solution. All right, so I want to give you a quick reminder on tagging of Docker images. When we tag a image, we put down usually our Docker ID, a slash, and then the repository or project name. Now, one other thing that we can optionally put in here is a colon and then a version for this image. And so we could put in something like, you know, V1. And then maybe the next time we build the image, we would increment it to V2 or V3 or V4 or V5 or whatever it is. So as a possible solution to this problem, we could decide to tag our images with real version numbers and then specify that version inside the config file. So in other words, when we build our image back over here inside of you know, run our docker build command and tag the image, we could put on a version number like v1, v2, v3, or v4, whatever it might be. We then push that tag up to docker hub, and then inside of our config file, we could append on that v1, v2, v3, v4, or whatever it is. Now, when we change the config file with a version number like this, this is an actionable change to our config file. So if I put on here v4 and then save the file and then rerun that kubectl apply command, that is detected as a very real change to our config file. And so the config file would be accepted by kubectl apply because we are specifying a completely different image version. Our deployment would then use that new image version to recreate and update all of the pods that it manages. So this would be one possible solution. Now, the downside to this approach is that it really adds in an extra step to our deployment process. And it's definitely not a very friendly step. Just think about what we would have to do. We would e essentially have to make sure that any time that we build our images, we would have to append on some version number over here, like you know, one, two, three, four, or five, whatever it is. And then we would have to go over to our configuration file and put the exact same version number inside of here as well. So we would have to remember the current version and somehow insert that number inside of here. And that's definitely a non-trivial step to add in here. Now, one quick workaround to that that you might imagine if you're you know, a little bit savvy, you might think, okay, well, if it's such a pain to get the version number in here, maybe we could get like an environment variable or something like that, that would carry the version of that image. So when we build the image, we could store the version number in an environment variable and then reference that environment variable inside of our file. So we could do something like, you know, client version. Well, unfortunately, we are not allowed to use environment variables inside of these config files. So that solution kind of goes out the window as being an easy workaround. So specifying the version, it definitely would work, but it adds in that extra step of having to assign a version number when we build the image. And then we also have to make sure that we somehow inject that version number into the file. We literally would have to inject the version number through some type of like templating process. So that definitely doesn't seem like it's a very good version or a very good solution as well. All right, so now the last thing that we could do is we could use an imperative command to update the image version that the deployment should use. So this is somewhat similar to the last step. It's saying that when we build our image, we would still append on a version number. So like, you know, V1, V2, V3, whatever it is. But then rather than updating our config file, we could immediately run a command after building our image that says to Kubernetes, essentially like, hey, Kubernetes, like go find my client deployment and update the version number, like, you know, I don't know, I'm just making up this command here, update version to V1 or something like that. Now, this is very similar 
to the previous step in that we are still going to tag our image with a version number, but the downside to this approach is that it's using an imperative command, and it's essentially completely skipping over our config file and keeping our config file up to date with the state of our cluster. So all three of these steps seem like you know bad solutions. They don't really seem like they're the best things in the world to solve this problem. I think without a doubt, the first solution over here is definitely very, very bad. I think that this solution right here is definitely a pain in the rear because we are making a change to our config file. And anytime that we're changing our config file, we would probably want to do a git commit, right? We would probably want to commit that new version. Well, the downside to wanting to do that git commit is that remember, we traditionally only build our versions with the, or build our images with the Docker build command right here when we are in a CI environment, like off on Travis CI. And so we're only on Travis CI when we've already made a git commit. So we're kind of talking about like making a git commit to update the image and then pushing this off to Travis, getting the image built right here, and then simultaneously taking that version number and updating this file and then committing this file too at the same time while we're still on Travis. Now, if that doesn't make sense, that's totally fine. What I'm trying to say is that this step right here, it definitely sounds like it's a good solution, but in practice, it ends up being a tremendous pain in the rear. So that kind of leaves us with solution three over here. We're going to use an imperative command. So after we rebuild an image, we are going to tag it with a version number. And then we're going to very specifically reach out to kubectl and tell it to update our deployment with the latest version of the image that we just pushed up to Docker Hub. Now I know this uses a imperative command and I just told you how we like to avoid these as much as possible. But again, this is kind of like the best of a bad situation. And I think that you'll see when we eventually deploy our application to a production environment, this ends up being like a pretty reasonable solution. It's not the best solution, but it's pretty reasonable when it really comes down to it. Ooh, okay, so this has been a very long section. I apologize for the length, but again, I wanted to make sure it's really clear that this is just a continuous not nice issue to have to deal with. And I wanted to go over some of these possible solutions because these three in particular get outlined in this issue thread over here if you decide to read this thing. All right, so with all that in mind, let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section. We're gonna learn how we can somehow tag our image with a unique version number when we build it, and then make sure that we can run a command that's going to tell our deployment to update itself with the latest version number available. So quick pause, and we'll come back in the next section. In this section, we're going to walk through the update process that we described at the end of the last section. So here's what we need to do. We're going to first tag our image with a distinct version number, and then we're going to push that new version up to Docker Hub. After that, we're going to run a rather long kubectl command that's going to forcibly update our deployment and tell it to use this new version of the image that we have pushed off to Docker Hub. So let's get to it. Step number one is going to be to tag our image. So to get started, I'm going to open up my terminal and I'm going to create a second terminal window and then change on over to that complex client directory. So I'll go into complex and I'll change into the client folder. So here's my client project. We have already built an image out of this folder and we have not made any changes to our project since then. So we could technically do a Docker tag here and tag the existing image that we already built. But instead, just to show you the entire flow, I'm going to build the entire image from scratch again. So I'll run Docker build and I'll tag this thing with my Docker ID slash multi-client and I'll make sure I get a colon on there. And then we have to put some unique token on the other side of the colon. And so for me as a version number, I'll just do like, I don't know, version five or something, anything you want to do. And then after that, I'll put down a period to specify the build context. Okay, so I'll run that command. The image is rebuilt and it's now tagged with your Docker ID slash multi-client colon V5. So now we need to make sure that we push this updated image over to Docker Hub. So I'll copy the entire tag right there and I'll do a Docker push and copy the tag in. All right, so just like that, we now have a new tagged image over on Docker Hub. So now we need to run a kubectl command that's going to force our deployment to use that new image version. Back inside my terminal, I'm gonna delete the second terminal window that I opened 
And so I'm left just with the original window that is based on the simple k8s directory. So inside of here, we're going to run a rather long command. I've got a quick diagram to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be writing out. All right, so here it is. Yes, it's rather long. So we're going to use kubectl, and we're going to use the set command. We use the set command to update a property on one of our objects that exist inside of our cluster. The specific property that you and I want to update is the image property. So the image property that is tied to our single container right here. After that, we'll specify the type of the object that we want to update. So in our case, we are not updating a container. We're not updating a pod. We are updating a deployment. That's what we're updating. So we're going to specify a deployment slash the name of our deployment, which for you and me is client-deployment right there. After that, we'll then specify the container name. So remember, a, con a deployment creates pods, and inside of a pod, we can have many different containers. Our specific pod template right here only has one container, but we could very easily have other containers inside of here as well. And all those other containers would have their own image property. So we need to make sure that we specify which of all of our containers we want to update. And we specify the container that we want to update by specifying the name. So we're going to say the container name, and for us, the container name is client. We'll then do an equal sign and then the full image that we want to use. So it'll be your Docker ID slash multi-client and then a colon and then the version number that you use to tag the image with. So that's the entire command. Let's give it a shot. Back inside my terminal, I'm going to run kubectl set image. Then we're going to do our object type, which is a deployment slash the object name which is client-deployment. Then we'll put in a space. So there is a space there. Notice how it wrapped the line for me, but there definitely without a doubt is a space there. And then I'll specify the container that I care about, which is client. And then the update that we're going to make is to say that we now want to use our Docker ID slash multi-client. And then the version that we want to use is whatever version you just used a second ago when we rebuilt our image. And so for me, it is V5. All right, so that's it. So we're going to run this command. And we get that our image has been updated. So now we can do a kubectl get pods. And you'll notice how we have a single pod here. And most importantly, it has an age of around five, six, seven, or however many seconds, which definitely means without a doubt that our pod was just recreated by our deployment. So now we get to test this out inside of our browser to make sure that the update actually went live. So remember to access our running container, we need our minikube IP. So there's the IP address. And then remember the port for our application or for this particular pod is 31515 as specified inside of our client node port service file. So inside my browser, I'll open up a new tab. I'll put in my IP address and I'll go to 31515. And then once here, I should see fib calculator version two. Now really quick, if you don't see version two, do not panic. The React application we put together has some caching built into it. So if you do not see version two over here, then the first thing I want you to do is give it a couple seconds and then do a quick refresh. Failing that, try opening up your Chrome console, expand this tab on network right here. You can select disable cache and then try refreshing again. And then if even that doesn't work, you can always run the set, where is that command? The big set image command here again. Try running that a second time. And then after all that, you should be able to eventually refresh this thing and see version two appear. Like I said, sometimes it does take a second or two for it to actually pop up the update inside of here, but you should eventually see it go live. All right, so that's it. That's how we update or how we tell a deployment that we want it to use the newer version of an image. Now, I think you'll agree with me that this entire process is definitely a little bit of a pain because we have to rebuild the image, we have to apply a unique tag version on it, and then we have to run that command. But when we eventually set up our entire cluster to be deployed off to either Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud, you and I are going to write together, are going to write out a big long script to facilitate our deployment. And inside that script, we're going to put all of this tagging logic and all the version tagging and all the kubectl set image command stuff as well. 
And so when we eventually move over to a production environment, all this versioning stuff is going to be completely automated for us and we're not gonna to have to do any additional work. So it's really just kind of understanding what's going on behind the scenes, that's the challenging part. Once you understand what's happening from then on out, life gets pretty darn easy. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Let's take a pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. When we first started talking about pods and deployments about a dozen videos or so ago, you might recall that I opened up my terminal at some point in time and I told you that I was going to run a series of commands and I also told you don't try to run these commands. I told you don't run these because you're probably going to see an error message or something like that. And so one of the commands that I ran at that point in time was a simple docker ps. Remember the docker ps commands will print out the status of all the different containers that are running on your local machine. So you saw me run this command, and when I did so, there appeared to be a tremendous number of containers running on my local machine. Now, if you open up your terminal right now and you run a Docker PS as well, you're probably only going to see like maybe zero, one, two, or three local containers. And chances are there are going to be containers that we had started up in previous sections that you never cleaned up or anything like that. So why am I seeing this output right here of all these different containers? And if you look at the name of them, they all be, appear to be very clearly related to Kubernetes. So why am I seeing all this output right here? And why are you only seeing one or two or three? Well, in this section, we're going to investigate this a little bit. We're going to get a better idea of what Docker is doing for us, both on our local computer and inside of that virtual machine that forms our node. And we're going to get a better idea of how we can kind of reach into the node and play around with the copy of Docker inside there. All right, so first off, couple diagrams. Now we've looked at some variations on this diagram right here a couple time. And we've gone over the process of what happens when we feed in a config file through kubectl a couple times as well. But I wanna give you just one more quick reminder of what's going on. So remember, we take a configuration file that wants to create either a pod or a deployment. We feed that into kubectl, that gets passed off to the master, and then the master reaches into the virtual machine and communicates with the copy of Docker that runs only inside of the virtual machine. And it tells it, hey, Docker client, we need to create a new container. Go off and grab this image and create a container out of it. The Docker client then turns around and says to the Docker server, hey, Docker server, we need to go and grab an image and we need to create a container out of it. And so it's then up to the Docker server to reach out to Docker Hub, download an image, store it inside of some local cache, and then build a container out of it. Again, we've gone over this flow several times. Now, something else that we've discussed a couple times is the fact that we have two copies of Docker running on your local machine right now. We have the copy of Docker that's running inside of the virtual machine, and we have the copy of Docker that we installed way back at the start of this course when we ran Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows. That's the copy of Docker that's associated with this status bar dropdown right here. All right, now I wanna show you something really interesting, all right? I'm gonna flip back over to my terminal, and inside of this terminal window right here, I'm going to run Docker PS again. When I run that, you're gonna see, yep, I've got all this output from Docker right here. And now I'm gonna open up a, another terminal window. So here's just another simple terminal window over here, and I'm going to do a Docker PS over here as well. And when I do it over here, it appears that I'm running absolutely no containers whatsoever. So what's going on here? Well, essentially, I have configured Docker inside of these two terminal windows to connect to one of these different Docker servers that's running on my local computer. So whenever I type in a command inside my terminal, I'm accessing the copy of Docker client that was set up with Docker for Mac when I installed it way earlier inside this course. My first terminal window over here, this one where I run Docker PS and I see no running containers whatsoever, this copy of the Docker client or the Docker CLI is connecting to the Docker server that is running on my local computer. And again, this is the copy of Docker server that was installed with Docker for Mac. In the second terminal window, I bet you can guess what's going on. In the second terminal window over here, I have configured my local copy of Docker client not to connect to my local Docker server. Instead, I have reconfigured it to talk to the copy of Docker server running inside of the virtual machine. So inside of this very specific terminal window right here, when I do a Docker PS, my copy of 
Docker client, the Docker CLI, is reaching into the virtual machine. It's getting in contact with a copy of Docker server inside there, and it's asking it, hey, what different containers are you running? And so that's why inside of this terminal window right here, I see this big list of Kubernetes related containers, including the multi-client container right here. And again, all these containers are running inside of my virtual machine. All right, so again, the idea here, I'll, all I want you to understand right now is that I have one copy of Docker client and between these two terminal windows, I have configured it to either talk to my local copy of Docker server or the copy of Docker server that is running inside of the virtual machine. So let's take a quick pause right here. Now that we understand that, when we come back in the next section, I'm gonna show you how you can reconfigure your local copy of Docker client to talk to Docker server inside the virtual machine. And of course, I'll also tell you why we would want to do this at all. All right, so quick break and we'll come back in the next section. In the last section, I showed you how I had multiple terminal windows open, and between the different terminal windows, I had reconfigured my copy of Docker client. And so in this section, I'm gonna show you how you can do the same thing, and then we'll talk a little bit about why you would want to do this at all. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Anytime that you want to configure your local copy of the Docker CLI, remember, that's the thing that we are accessing inside of our terminal. This is Docker CLI right here. If you want to reconfigure your copy of Docker CLI to communicate with a copy of Docker server inside of the virtual machine, we're going to run this command right here. So I'm gonna copy that command. I'm gonna go over to a new terminal window. And over here, when I do a Docker PS, you'll see that I am clearly connected to my local copy of Docker server. Now I'm going to run that command right there. I'll leave it on the screen so you can read it. And you can type it inside of your terminal if you want to. So when I run this command right here, it's going to very temporarily reconfigure my copy of Docker client or Docker CLI to connect to the Docker server inside of my Kubernetes node. So after running that command, I can now do a Docker PS and I'll see the print up from all the different containers that are running inside of my virtual machine. Now, quick note here, and this is an extremely important thing to understand. Any time that you run that eval command right there, it is a very temporary reconfiguration of your Docker CLI. So when you run this command, it's only going to reconfigure your Docker CLI in your current terminal window. What that means is right here, if I do a Docker PS, I clearly am working with the reconfigured version of the Docker client. But as soon as I open up a new terminal window, it goes back to its old behavior. So when you run that command, two things to be aware of. First off, it is not a permanent change. You're not permanently reconfiguring your copy of Docker client. The other thing to remember is that if you decide to close down your terminal window, maybe you take a break from Docker or something like that, or you turn off your computer and close all the programs running on it. If for whatever reason you close that terminal window, you have to rerun this command right here to reconfigure your Docker CLI again. All right, so just to really make sure that's very clear, I'm gonna show you one more time. I know this is getting a little bit repetitive, but I can just about guarantee you that at some point in time, you're gonna run Docker PS and say, hey, wait, why am I not seeing everything inside the virtual machine? So when I run that command and do a Docker PS, I see everything inside of the virtual machine. As soon as I open up a new terminal window and do a Docker PS again, back to old behavior. So throughout the rest of this course, if I ever say to you, hey, let's see what Docker inside the virtual machine is doing, you need to make sure that you first run that command right there. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to look inside of the virtual machine and figure out what the copy of Docker inside there is doing. Now, just in case you're curious about what exactly this command right here is doing, you can actually take just the minikube docker env command right there and run it by itself. When you do so, do so, you'll see that it's actually just exporting a couple of environment variables. So just so you know, whenever you use a Docker CLI command, like say Docker PS right here, when it, Docker is invoked, it's going to look at a set of environment variables to decide what copy of Docker server it is supposed to connect to and attempt to execute this command on. So when we run this minikube docker env command with the eval command especially, it's gonna set up some new environment variables that are going to tell Docker CLI to reach into the virtual machine to find the copy of Docker server that is supposed to work with. And if you look at this docker host 
variable right here, you might even be able to recognize the IP address. It's actually the IP address of your Minikube server. For example, if you do Minikube IP right now, you'll see it prints out the identical IP address to what we're telling the Docker client to attempt to connect to. All right. Now, one last thing I want to mention here, it's kind of hard to remember this entire command by itself. You know, it's kind of hard to remember this and have to recall it at some point in the future when you want to reconfigure your shell. I found that a very easy way to remember this command is to instead memorize the command minikube docker env by itself. Remember, that's what we just ran two seconds ago to print out all those environment variables. When you run just minikube docker env by itself, it will actually tell you, hey, if you want to configure your shell or essentially your current terminal window, here's what you need to run. And it's the full length command with the eval on there as well. So a very easy way of memorizing how to do this is not to memorize the eval part, just memorize minikube docker env. That's all you have to remember. And as long as you can remember that, type that in, and then it will tell you exactly what to type right here. So you can copy paste that in and boom, you're good to go. All right, so that is what is going on when we run that Docker PS and see a listing of all the containers inside the virtual machine. Now, the very last thing I wanna tell you is why we would want to do this, right? Why would we ever want to look at the copy of Docker running inside of the virtual machine? Especially since I told you when we first started looking at Kubernetes that you and I as developers do not mess around with the inner workings of the virtual machine. Remember, I told you we don't mess around with the virtual machine ourselves. We leave it up to the master to change the configuration of the virtual machine or change the different containers running inside there. So let's take a quick pause right now. When we come back to the next section, we'll talk about why we might want to reach into this thing and inspect the different containers that are running and kind of mess around with them a little bit. All right, so quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we learned how to temporarily reconfigure a single terminal window to access our Docker server running inside the virtual machine. I want to remind you again, you have to rerun that command every single time that you open up a new terminal window. All right, so I'm gonna very quickly paste this inside of here just to make sure it's really clear that I'm going to reconfigure my current terminal window right here. Now, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about why we would want to do this at all. Why would we want to reach into the virtual machine and take a look at the Docker server and all the containers that are running inside there? Well, I put together a couple of reasons that I think you might wanna do this. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. So I just want you to have an additional tool in your little toolkit for working with Kubernetes so that you can understand how to kind of get a better idea of how to play around with all this stuff. All right, so a couple of reasons that you might want to mess around with Docker inside of our node. The first reason is that you can use all the same debugging techniques that we had learned much earlier in this course to inspect containers and get logs from them and do all that kind of stuff when you connect to the copy of Docker running inside the node. So for example, remember right here again, I just reconfigured my shell. So I'm gonna do a Docker PS. And when I do so, I can scroll all the way back up to the top and get the ID of my multi-client container right here. So I'm gonna copy that ID. Now I can get logs out of that container by doing a very classic Docker logs, and then the ID of the container. Remember, this is something we covered way long ago at the very start of the course. Now in this case, our container has not emitted any logs, so I get nothing back here, but I could do other commands as well, such as say, executing an arbitrary program or a secondary program inside the container. So for example, if I want to start up a shell inside of that container, I could do a docker exec it, then the container ID, and then I'll start up shell inside there. And so when I do that, I can very simply get a shell and I can start to poke around and get a better idea of the state of my container if I want to. Now, the one kind of caveat to this, the one thing I want to mention is that a lot of these different debugging commands are actually available through kubectl as well. So for example, I can still pull logs using kubectl from a very specific container. And I can start up a shell inside of a specific container using kubectl as well. As a very quick example of that, I'll do a kubectl get pods. I'm gonna copy the name of my pod right here. And then I'll do a kubectl logs, and I'll paste the name of the pod. And again, I don't get anything back because the container has not emitted any logs, but it definitely would retrieve logs if any had been em emitted. I can also do a kubectl exec it, and then the pod name, and then sh on the very end to start up a shell. And so the same thing right here, yeah, I'm starting up a shell using kubectl as well. 
So again, you can use all the knowledge that you have of Docker to do a lot of debugging. However, a lot of that stuff is already available with kubectl. So I'm going to kind of leave it up to you if you want to figure out how to do this stuff through kubectl, or if you want to just stick with your knowledge that you've already gained of Docker and use those same techniques as well. Now, the next reason that we might want to mess around with Docker inside of our node is so that we can do exactly what I did a little bit ago inside the course, where I manually deleted a container, and then we were able to observe that, oh, hey, it was restarted automatically. So essentially, you can test Kubernetes' ability to self-heal or restart crashed containers or whatever it might be by reaching into there and deleting a container manually. Now, that's not a great reason to do this, but I just want to say it's something that you could possibly do if you felt like it. Now, the other reason that you might do this is that if you're for some reason having a really tough time figuring out why images are being cached inside of your node, I'm talking about Docker images here, and if for some reason it feels like you're not able to update the image that a particular container is used is using, you can always reach into the container, access the copy of Docker inside there, and say, hey, delete your image cache, and just blow away all the cached images that you have. And so to do that, we could run the same command that we had learned way long ago. We can do a docker system prune a, and this will remove all stop containers, all unused networks, and all build cache, and all images that are not being used at this point. And so I could just blow away everything inside there if for some reason I felt like there was a big caching issue with what was going on inside of my node. Okay, so that's it. That's a couple of reasons on why you would want to mess around with Docker in the node. Now, I just give these to you as like possibilities. Again, I'm rather convinced that you can think of some better reasons than what I've listed here of messing around with Docker inside the node. But again, I just wanted to give you a couple examples to kind of get your brain going and give you a reason to look into this feature a little bit more. All right, so let's take a pause right here and we'll continue in the next section.